Hello, we're we we there? We there? Okay, cool. Hi, all the planeswalkers out there. Welcome to your Lionheart Podcast, episode one. I am your host, Jensen, and I'm here with Mr. Justin and Mr. Adam. Why don't we take a turn and introduce ourselves? Justin? Hey, I am Justin. I am the owner of Lionheart Games in White Park. Hi, I'm Adam. Adam, tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, what, what kind <laughs> of uh, games do you usually like to play, magic-wise? Uh, magic-wise, EDH. EDH? It's all about EDH. It's the format you like to play, and who is the, uh, your favorite general for EDH? Riku of the Two Reflections. I like it. I like it. It's a very versatile card. Or the... Sig the River Cut Throat or Skithorex. Toss up. We went we went uh, towards the black very fast there from a very colorful stream of uh, <laughs> of a powerful commander. Uh, and me, well, what should I say about myself? I started playing Magic uh, back during the Lauren block when Planeswalkers was still first a new thing for everybody. And since then, I have played on and off. But for the most part, I have really really enjoyed. EDH as well as Tiny Leader as formats and uh, currently I really like where the standard has been shaped into. Uh, we no longer have the, how do I put it, you know, the back day in the day like John the days. Uh, we have more, more or less a more versatile format to play with. So I know you're so young when I started playing there weren't even planeswalkers. <laughs> yeah, right? Man. <laughs> I started Man. playing back in Prophecy. God, that's. I wish I was around during the older set, partially because cards were expensive, but also because uh, they were the game was quite different back in the day. Justin, when did you first start playing Magic? I think I started playing Magic around Eighth Edition, definitely because I remember getting one of those Eighth Edition starters and it had a bunch of rats and stuff in it, and I think I still have like the little box laying around somewhere. But then I also remember like Mirrodin and and Onslaught. So I can't really tell exactly when and what. I was, I was too young. I think I was like 13. It was def definitely Prophecy. My favorite card at the time was Avatar of Woe. Yeah, oh see, that card was goodness. already out when, when I started playing. That card playing, was so. stupid good back when I started playing, and now it's like good, but it's not great. All right, Planeswalkers, it, it sounds like I have definitely started playing Magic way later than those two <laughs> gentlemen right here. All right, well, moving forward, uh, what are you... What are your expectation, uh, expectations from the show is uh, uh, every, every weekly or bi-weekly we'll be uploading a Lionheart podcast. We'll be talking about interesting shifts in uh, mostly EDH. Uh, if there's a new set come out, we'll be looking to break down the set and talk about powerful and unique cards that might make an appearance in different kind of decks. What, do you, what we are excited about and what we want to play test with. Uh, in addition to that, we will also be talking about if there are any interesting uh, shifts in standard or other format briefly as well. So today, our focus on this podcast will be Kaladesh, the set that will be coming out in roughly two weeks' time. Uh, let's first talk about the first impression of Kaladesh. Uh, Kaladesh is this very vibrant plane where you have... Um, even though you have the same amount of artifacts you are experiencing, they have a very different flavor, right? It's a very colorful plane. It's a very busy plane. There's lots of quote-unquote racing going on with all the vehicle and the new stuff going on. Uh, I remember talking with you gentlemen earlier about how this set doesn't even sound like an, a typical magic set. Uh, Adam, why don't we talk about that for a little bit? Oh, it does. When me and Jensen first looked up spoilers, we saw vehicles and we're like, what is this? This right. can't even be real. Right. I remember reading a card that's like, when, when this pilot crews a vehicle, something, something happens. It like, gets haste. Coming from a 8th edition point of view, Justin, what do you think of, uh, of wordings like that? It's definitely a lot different than my uh, rats and zombies. That's for sure. Right. Uh, yeah. Like it, it's just kind of it's kind of crazy to see how much it's changing and it's shifting. And now with this set, I think they're taking a really big step forward, adding this new uh, vehicle mechanic. I think it's pretty gutsy. I really, I really like that. I agree with you as well. I think uh, this set is more focused on the future 
uh, compared to the planes we've had recently, right, Adam? Like, we just left Innistrad, which yeah. is a revisit set, but it was very gory. Um, previously, we had Battle for Zendikar, which is also kind of nuts with all the Aldrazi's killing everything. Yeah, but I mean, on the vehicle thing, though, I don't think it's that much of a step forward. I mean, it's essentially the same thing Innistrad did with the gods that were enchantments and creatures, but you needed devotion for them to be creatures. It's just kind of the same turn there. You mean you mean Theros, not Innistrad, right? The, yes, the that gas. is what I mean. <laughs> you just you mentioned Innistrad, and that's where my mind I I went. yes, it was yes. I understand. I understand. But other than that, they said the Chandra's home world, and it's supposed to be like one of the biggest sets since the original Innistrad block, is from what I've heard. Interesting. So. From from what you heard, would you say that Wizards is really trying to push the cards from this set as far as uniqueness, creativity, and power level? Yeah, some of the cards have lots of power. I mean, I like the way the set looks. There's lots of good cards. I wish I could afford more than one EDH deck to play some of them. Same, same. But I've heard this is a set where you want to buy a couple boxes, have one or two for yourself, and set the other one away so you can sell it for a bundle later. Yeah, I like that. Uh, speaking of, you know, purchasing the set, Justin, mm -hmm. uh, at Lionheart Games, we sell Kaladash set, right? That is correct. Uh, how much would be the uh, price for the pre-order on the boxes? $100 flat. Sounds good. Sounds good. That's very good information to know. Lowest prices in the area. Can't be beat for pre-orders. <laughs> All right. You guys heard it from Mr. Adam here. Uh, since we were just talking about how Wizard is really trying to push this set. Why don't we look at some of the powerful mythics from the set? Uh, some of the things that we've, that has been spoiled are very, very interesting, particularly for those of you who likes to play EDH, who's trying out new decks. I think there's a lot of new additions to the, to the meta, to the family. Uh, Justin, yeah. uh, let's start by your favorite mythic of the set. Well, my favorite mythic has got to be the Sky Sovereign Consult flagship. Now, I took a look at it in the art. Consult flagship. Co consult. Not consult. Yep. I, it's a very epic name. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but it, it looks kind of cool. It's, uh, you know, it's flying up in the air there. The artwork's pretty awesome. I've always considered myself to be somewhat of a, a pirate, and I would definitely <laughs> captain, captain that ship around Kaladesh. Raiding and looting, I don't even know if that's legal. I don't know, but is, is your power three or more so you can actually crew it? It's a very important thing to know. It does have crew three, which for those of you watching at home, uh, crew three is a new mechanic introduced in the set where in order for you to crew a vehicle, the X number behind the word crew is the overall power of any number of creatures you must tap in order to power the set, so to speak. Yeah, so you tap those three dudes on there. So, like, if I were to take Jensen and Adam and Marty, and then I tapped you guys, I would be the captain of this new ship, and it would be a 6-5 flying. And when it does combat damage or enters the battlefield, it deals three damage to target creature planeswalker. And I would just like to point out, it doesn't even have to do combat damage. It's just an ETB or attack trigger. Yeah, this uh, reminds... Uh, real um, similar, uh, the feeling we get from this card is very similar to all the Titans from oh, the core set. I honestly think it's like, it's essentially an Inferno Titan, except you can choose when it needs to be a creature. It's a different variance of the Inferno Titan. I, yeah. I would agree, I would agree. Um, I and definitely want to want to ride on an Inferno Titan though. So I would not want to ride on an <laughs> Inferno Titan either. There you have it, folks. We don't want to ride on an Inferno Titan. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about the crew mechanic a little bit, given that this is one of the core mechanics of the set. Uh, Justin, what would some of the benefits of cards with crew have that other cards without it would not usually have access to? Uh, it, it avoids uh, board wipes. You know, like, uh, you can make it not a creature, so then it doesn't get, like, blown up by, like, Wrath of God or whatever else, right? That's even right. avoids Black Sun, Zenith, Skin Render, in fact, you know, like anything that could affect it. Right, mm -hmm. for sure. If it's not a creature, it doesn't do anything to right. it. Right, so you're just kind of like floating around, you know, in your ship, and you're like, I'm going to fly up above this giant sun blast, or whatever. <laughs> That's, that is definitely true. I think crew mechanic takes actual, like, a fair bit of spell to play, because when you crew a vehicle, 
uh, of any sort. The vehicle does turn into a creature until end of the turn, so the timing on the crew is, is quite essential. And when you are crewing a vehicle, it doesn't always mean you are attacking, right guys? Like sometimes you are crewing it to block. As well, like yeah, a, and that was going to be my next point, is not only can you use it as a block, but like one of the staples in EDH is a Terracidon. I mean, if they choose to target that and you have it, boom, it's a creature, and now they can't do it because Terracidon is a non-creature. Right, you can play around a lot of cards that deal with different types, you know, way by turning it into a creature. So I definitely agree with that. So Sky Summoner is going to have a lot of applications. It's definitely, definitely a powerful, powerful card to look out for in the new set. Uh, Adam, why don't we talk about your favorite card of the set? My favorite card by far has to be Chandra. And I know there's two Chandras in the set. Yeah, let's let's take a moment and talk about that real quick. Why are there two Chandras in, in the set, quote unquote? I honestly have no idea. Oh, <laughs> Low. Okay. it's our home plane. I, I don't know why they went and decided to make two different Chandras and two different Nissas. From from my understanding, um, there are two versions of the Chandra and Nissa because one of the two versions uh, comes out in a dual deck. So that deck is catering mm. for players who are maybe new to Magic. You can you can see the mechanic on the on the one Chandra one Nissa particularly is easier to grasp and it's easier to play against each other. Uh, so the other one, the other Chandra, Chandra Torch of uh, Defiance is actually the one that Adam is most interested in acquiring. It's, it's by far my favorite card. There's speculations that it's going to be like a Jace the Mind Sculptor. I mean, the cost is the same as, with the exception of, you know, two colorless and two red versus the two colorless and two blue to play it. It also comes into play with one additional loyalty counter, so that's four over Jace's three. But her abilities are up one, exile the top card of your library, you may cast that card. If you don't, Chandra Torch of Defiance deals two damage to each opponent. So that's versatile because if you don't get anything you can cast, you're still dealing damage to your opponents. Right, and this has applications <clears throat> in two out of giant as well. As well, yeah. And her other plus one, she has two of them, is add two red mana to your mana pool. So essentially, if you want, you're dropping her for two colorless mana. And that's just phenomenal. For negative three, she deals four damage to target creature, which is also great for board removal on small, some of the smaller creatures in EDH. Absolutely. Especially in standard when you're going to see more smaller creatures. Absolutely. My favorite part about her though is the negative seven she's got for being such a cheap planeswalker with four loyalty counters. Negative seven, you get an emblem with whenever you cast a spell, this emblem deals five damage to target creature or player. And to me, that's just insane. I mean, in my EDH deck, I'm taking out Ral Zarek for that. Seems pretty good. They both ramp and uh, Chandra has a little bit more control variance compared to Ral, Zer Ral Zarek, I would say. I mean, especially you combine that in EDH with the top where you can set up which card you're exiling to and control that a little bit more, or Sylvan Library or whatnot. Or Squirrel Rack, things yeah. like that. Yep, I definitely, definitely would agree with that. Uh, let's, um, let's take a look real quick at one of my favorite cards coming from the new set. This, I think, is not particularly a, a broken kind of card for EDH, but I think that it enables a new or it enables and builds onto an existing archetype in EDH. So the card I'm mostly interested in is uh, uh, Metal uh, Metallurgic Summoning. I have some trouble speaking the name here. So this is a five mana enchantment. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, create a XX colorless construct artifact token, creature token, where X is the spell's converted mana cost. So right away, I'm thinking maybe play, you know, is it, kind of instant sorcerer oriented EDH deck mm. where we're playing with like Jay Sanctum and things like that where we take heavy advantage on casting spells for cheap um, where we're constantly taking extra turn we're countering spell we're playing all the removals and maybe a lot of wheel effects with this every time we play something like that we gain value by having a board presence uh, through the power of this enchantment but that doesn't stop there uh, what makes this card even better is that it has a second part of unique effect is that you can pay five mana, two blue and three colorless, exile this enchantment, 
and return all instant and source requests from your graveyard to your hand. Now, uh, this is an extremely, extremely relevant ability in EDH. We all know graveyard recursion can be very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. And uh, imagine a game where you are constantly countering spells. You guys are both low on cards. And all of a sudden, you go, hey, look, I have six one ones or six two twos. Here, I'm gonna get all of my counter spell back. At that point, I would say it's pretty much game over. Uh, I know that, uh, Adam, you particularly have played different variants of uh, control kind of decks. Uh, Blue, Black, Sidre, for example. Um, what are your thoughts on the recurring part of this card? Oh, I think it's a fantastic card. It's the first time I'm actually seeing it because I haven't been up to date with all the spoilers yet. Sure, sure. But probably I'd put it in Riku. The problem is, is I don't know what I take out. But it's phenomenal. I run a 50-50 split on creatures and instant and sorcery, so it would be a great card to have in there in any deck, like even the most recent red-blue commander deck, mm -hmm. or pretty much any variation of anything that's running a lot of instants or sorceries, it's just phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and also, Justin, uh, when we talk about EDH, you always mention like powerful, powerful instant and sorcery spells, like you really like to kick off the game with, you know, like different kind of tutor effect, right? Mm -hmm. uh, different kind of like stuff like show and tell and things like that, that's kind of all right, breaks the game. Right. Uh, do you think this card adds onto the existing power level of those kind of decks, or do you think this card is somewhat slow uh, in comparison to what those decks can already accomplish? I think it, you know, it kind of depends on you know your your own play style. Um, it, it mm -hmm. overall, I would say that it's a good card. I, I I think it's a little bit slow, but if it used in the right you know, combination, the right deck at the right time, you know, uh, I think it could be really powerful and it can definitely be used as a game changer if you're a little bit behind in a game, so. I like it. Yeah, you can you can play your time warp and still get a dude out of it. Right. Uh, that's pretty powerful in right. and of itself. So, so essentially for me, it's like in my deck, if I put it in Riku, it's like having another Praetor's Council most of the time. Yeah. Because most of the time I'm doing Praetor's Council just to get my counter spells and other removal spells back into my hand. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, definitely, definitely. <clears throat> All right, uh, moving on. Let's talk about another one of Justin's uh, highly anticipated card in EDH. We got this big baddie here. It's uh, Ver... I don't even know how to say that. Verderus? Verderus Gear Hulk. Yeah, so he's huge. He's a big dude. He costs, he costs five, two green, three colorless, and he comes out, he's a four, four, He's got trample, and he gets to distribute four plus one plus one counters on any creature. So essentially, you could just drop him, if I'm not mistaken, and just put it right on him. Yeah. Worst Absolutely. case scenario, he's a five drop eight eight with trample. I mean, you need them counters somewhere else. You can put them on flyers or anything else, little unblockable stuff, depending on what your deck is. Mm -hmm. yeah, he's, he's just a big dude. He he's just comes out versatile as well. Very yeah. versatile, and I have a very hard time seeing. Uh, people being able to out temple this card in limited format. Right. So, definitely. And uh, what do you think about people abusing the ETB ability? Uh, for those of you who are watching at home, ETB stands for Enter the Battlefield. Uh, what do you think about like abusing the ETB abilities with stuff like um, uh, anything that blinks? Do yeah, so like uh, that one angel that like you get to pull somebody back up and then throw them back down, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Conjurer's Closet or Dead Eye Navigator, things like that. Right, yeah, that'd be, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. And you just keep flashing Dead it. Dead Eye Navigator, out. even with Riku, I mean, that's going to be very powerful in my Riku deck if I find a spot for it as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I constantly abuse Riku and Dead Eye Navigator. Yeah, so this is just as to the existing power trifecta, so to speak. It's oh. another tool. A lot of my a lot of my favorite like big green baddies, they always get banned right away in EDH. So I mean hopefully, hopefully this hopefully one survives. He's, hopefully he's not up there with that power level, but I think it's super, super powerful and it can be easily abused by any combination of 
uh, cards. So absolutely, For a Sylvan primordial. For a Sylvan. <laughs> uh, yeah, sad, sad day, sad days. Mm-hmm. And also, the artwork on this card is fantastic. I have to point out. I think in foil, or maybe like if one day they do a full art of this card, that'll be that'll be amazing. Yeah, it's very cool because it's just a huge artifact hulking over the buildings. Yeah, you can even see a person by comparison. Yeah, and it's maybe the size of his closed palm. <laughs> It's kind of like Attack like on Titan. He's got like a yeah, fist Attack on making, Titan. And the dude Thanks for the shot that on size. that. And real quick, before we move on, this card reminds me of Wolfire Silverheart from the original Innistrad. For those of you who didn't know, they had a soul bond mechanic where you got a 5 mana 4-4 four, four werewolf. If you pair it with another creature, both of them can get plus 4, plus 4. And in a way, this card just very closely reminds me of Wolfire Silverheart, which was one of my favorite cards back in Standard. Uh, in the days. Uh, all right, let's go to, I'm really hyped about this card. Let's go to another card I really want to get from the new set. Uh, this is the new red-blue Planeswalker. Uh, you guys are gonna have to help me out with this one uh, because I, I don't know how to accurately pronounce the My name. My personal take on it is Sahili Rai. Sahili Rai, like roll the tongue a little bit. Or like Ra. Ra. Right, Rye, Rye. I don't know. Right. I'm, I'm sorry for you guys who are, you know, trying to endure us pronouncing, probably heavily, heavily <laughs> abusing the pronunciation of this card. I, I really don't know. This is this Indian, probably. No. Yeah, that's kind of what I was going with the with the rolling for Mid- Sahili Rye. Right. Yeah. Right. It's so- Middle Eastern. Some. Some better than what I was what I was trying to pronounce, which I'm not even gonna try. <laughs> oh come on, you have to do it. Fanatics. <laughs> um, so uh, guys, I really like this card because I mean the the cost of this card is super aggressive. We're talking about deck Faden in comparison. Uh, three mana, one red, one blue, one colorless. Which by the way is tiny leader viable, guys. This is legal in the format. But uh, for three mana, you got three loyalty plus one. You get to scry one, and it deal one damage to each opponent. The deal damage part isn't super relevant, but being able to scry this early in the game, I think has a lot of uh, utility attached to it. In, my, I, I, it's, in EDH, it's very easy to get her out by turn one or turn two. And that active scry, I would almost prefer over Thessa, uh, the god of the sea, uh, because uh, I don't know, the, she seems a lot more versatile in a way. Uh, her negative two is what I'm mostly excited about. So the way I like to evaluate Planeswalker is usually by the negative because they offer the most amount of uh, interactions with others in a game of magic. So her negative two is create a token that's a copy of target artifact or creature you control, except it's an artifact in addition to other types. That token gains haste, exile at the beginning of the end of the turn. The possibility here, I have to say, is quite insane. Uh, I mean, Let's take a let's let's go around real quick. I mean, Adam, you play Riku, so I can see this card go right in and create co- tokens of very powerful creatures that you would want to play. Definitely. And uh, and Justin, like uh, I know you like artifact quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, in particular, maybe play ways like Mind Slaver and things like that. Yep. Um, it seems to me, pay three mana, neck to her, get a get a copy of Mind Slaver. You know, hey, is Mind Slaver legendary artifact? Mind Slaver is not legendary artifact, but there's things like late game, like Blight Steel Colossus. Sure. I mean, you're probably winning anyways with yeah. that. Maybe. But you can target two people at once. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. So, I mean, like, it seems like three mana get a Mind Slaver activated. It seems very, very good. It seems like it would be good with swords. Absolutely. It gets two triggers. Right. I mean, I mean, it would be good. You can make a copy of the sword. I mean, again, it's getting exiled at the beginning of the next end step, so it's not permanent. But either way, just that once having an extra sword is always good, too. Right. Yeah. And I'm a believer of early mana ramp, so I think even make a copy of uh, a Sorin for a turn or a mana vault or even mana crypt for a turn. It is extremely powerful. Getting her out on turn one, and you can possibly have two, six, or seven, or eight mana by turn two, and uh, cast your tooth and down, just win the game at that point. Uh, I'm almost, of course, biased in this situation because I also like the fruit basket color that Adam's plays. Uh, my favorite one, uh, my favorite commander is Maelstrom Wonder, and I think she fits right into my deck. 
Uh, let's go real quick to the alt. So her ultimate costs seven loyalty counters. Search your library for up to three artifact cards with different names and put them onto battlefield and shuffle your library. I'm very, you know, way happy with the different names because I feel like it's very uh, friendly with EDH, how, how the format is and stuff like that, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but being able to tutor three specific thing and, you know, quote unquote, you know, cast, not really, but like put them onto the battlefield without paying mana cost, you cannot, I, I have a very hard time imagining you lose the game at that point. Right. So this is the card I really, really like. Uh, moving on, let's talk about a very interesting card that's coming out that's, that suits Adam's preference. This is a commander worthy card, would you yeah, say? It's a commander, if not an include in some of the black decks you're gonna be playing. What is the name of this card, Adam? It is Gonti, Lord of Luxury. He's a two three death touch for two colorless, two black. But the real kicker is when you cast him, you get to exile the top four cards of target opponent's library. Or sorry, you get to look at the top four of target opponent's library. You get to exile one of them Put the other three back on the bottom in any order. And for as long as that card remains exiled, you can cast it by spending your mana and your mana can tap for any color to cast it. What makes you like this card so much? Can we go through it real quick? Well, I mean, sometimes, like, for example, if you're playing black-blue, for example, which is one of my other favorite combinations, you know, for SIG, is you don't have a lot of, like, removal for artifacts or enchantments at all. And so even then, like, you can potentially cast something off the top of their deck if you need it, or even if they got a really card. I mean, bare minimum, like, with all the Eldrazi's you're seeing played in EDH, I mean, you can just exile an Emrakul or a Kozilek or any of those just so they can't cast it, and then if you have the mana, cast it. Sure. This, this card is skills with player skill and player knowledge, you would say? Yeah. I mean, even in a five, like if they're playing a five color deck, I mean, there's not a single card you won't be able to cast from their deck. Sure. Absolutely. And if you are, I imagine if, uh, if Gonti here makes uh, into the list of commanders we'll be seeing in the future, then a recurrable Thassis and let you cast whatever spell seems to be very, very good. Yeah. Uh, give you a lot of answers and let you play other people's deck, which is always very, very fun. Which is one of my favorite things to do. Absolutely. Uh, it creates a lot of uh, variety of play uh, that you wouldn't normally have, which I, I completely agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, cool, very, very, very good. Uh, this is only less than half of all the mythics that in the set. Those are the six cards that we are particularly excited about here at Lionheart Games. Uh, Justin, uh, can you give us um, some thoughts on the uh, impact that this set is going to have on the current standard? Um, you know, I think, I think it's going to, well, for here, definitely, it's going to give it an opportunity to kind of refresh from what, what's going on in standard right now. I think it's going to add a bunch of cool different mechanics that, you know, that we can play with that we've never seen before. So, I mean, I'm interested to see what uh, a lot of my players have for, for brews, you know, what they're coming up with and what the, the current meta is going to shift to with the new introduction of Kaladesh and the rotation of dragons of Tarkir and uh, the Magic Origin set. Mm -hmm. When you say when you say you are very excited in looking to see what our player base comes up with their own brews, uh, you do you mean that the decks people bring to our EDH league on Saturday? Yeah, EDH league. You know whether it's going to be you know they're adding stuff to their decks or if they're building entirely new decks. You know mm -hmm. based off of new commanders or wanting to add certain cards mm -hmm. into it. Uh, uh, Mr. Adam over here uh, also runs the EDH League. Can you tell us a little bit about our EDH League? Uh, what do you need to do to enter and what people usually do on a Saturday? Uh, Saturday, people start showing up anywhere from as early as noon when we open the shop. A lot more people filter in between 4 and 6. We officially kick things off around 6.30ish. It's $5 to play. You can win Star City Games tokens, pins. We got play mats you can buy and purchase too. And it's just a fun game for $5. I mean, if you come two weeks and you don't get a pin, we'll give you a free booster pack. That sounds very awesome. Yeah, very, very good system. 
But um, one thing I would like to talk to before we move on, because Justin said new mechanic, is what do you think about the energy mechanic they're adding? Me? Anybody. I, I, I mean, I'm talking like... So I, I will take this one uh, for, the, for the time being. I think it's very interesting. Uh, most likely we'll be seeing those energy counter in the, in the form of a commander loyalty counter, uh, where you have a, uh, I think that's a cog, right? Like an actual card with a cog on it, and then you just put the dice on top of the, on top of the card, because that's what Wither has been doing. Uh, but so far from what I've seen, it's just the alternative way of paying mana on certain abilities. It seems to be a little bit limited, but there have already been a few cards that I want to try out in EDH. If there are enough effects, enough cards with a similar effect in the next set and this set, I think we'll see some staple ramps or staple card draw, something that related to the energy counters. It also helps that there's a rare in the set that ETB abilities triggers twice. Again, ETB stands for Into the Battlefield, and a lot of these energy cards have the ETB tag on them. And just better feel all game multiple counters. Now you get double. And I think that really kicks things off in a very fast fashion. Perfect. Cool. Cool. All right, guys. I think that concludes it for our very first episode here with uh, Justin and Adam. Is there anything else you would like to introduce or I talk about real quick before we close up? I'm, I'm good. I don't have really anything else. No, I think that's about it. I mean, I'm real excited to see how the set does and get some of them cards for my own decks. Very, very cool. Justin, we have a website, right? We have a Facebook page. Yep, we got a Facebook page, YouTube how, page. How can people reach us so, on Facebook? Facebook backslash Lionheart Games LLC. That's Lionheart Games LLC. And uh, how would people find us on YouTube? Um, Besides the fact that you're already watching this <laughs> podcast. Right. So, yeah, you just... Uh, you if just you're telling on. our friends about this. Right, right. It's just uh, Lionheart Games. So, user would just be Lionheart Games. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you, gentlemen, very much for joining me on this very first podcast. Uh, guys, you know, uh, this is only our very first attempt. I'm sure we could have done a lot of things better. If there are feedbacks that help us improve our quality of the podcasts please let us know in the comment below. Also, it would be awesome if you smash that like button and subscribe to our channel so that you can keep in touch with our future content as well. Adam over here is going to have a new series coming up soon. And there is another gentleman that we would like to introduce you to here at Lionheart. His name is Marty. And uh, unfortunately, he's not with us here today, but he will have his own series as well. Uh, once again, thank you very much for joining us here on the podcast. My name is Jensen. I am your show host, and Lionheart is signing out.